You know, a lot of times there's what's called an unsung hero in the business. And the business I mean is the business of professional wrestling. Hi, I am Chris Tidwell, Notorious TID. This is TID's Kick in the Head. And joining me is a man who exemplifies exactly that. This is a guy who you may not know the name, but by the time we're done here, you're definitely going to know the name. And the name is Cowboy Mike Hughes. And Mike Hughes is a guy that I've known for, wow, since Christ was a corporal many, many years into the business and the stories and the road that this man has traveled is exemplary. There's not a lot of territories left in the world of professional wrestling, but he actually lives and has lived through the transition of one of those territories from the way that it was to the way that it is. So without any further ado, Cowboy Mike Hughes, how you doing, brother? Long time no see, man. Oh man, it's been great. And I, I think it's, it was like night, fall of 99 that you and I met when we started that first real action wrestling journey, when we started to revive the territory of the Maritimes from the, the older days, right? Like, I was very fortunate I got to break in with, uh, with Emile Dupre in Grand Prix Wrestling. And, you know, the first right out of the gate, you got to get trained and everything like that, barely. And I mean barely for a couple of months and then right on the road for 157 nights straight. Right. So I was very lucky, man, but that's a long time. We're, we're not getting any younger, right? Like the uh, of back then. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. You talk about those days and, and you hear more and more stories um, about guys that just go out there, get whatever possible training, pr pretty much just enough to protect yourself. Yeah. In the business. I don't even know if I got that. <laughs> and, then, and then everything else that you learn, like the psychology and the and and the business itself, the behind the scenes stuff, you learn all of that on the fly. You learn all of that on the road. There's no doubt about it, right? Well, I definitely learned that. Like I said, that the minimal training I had, what I did is I I sent a picture to him. I actually met Ed and Christian and Glenn Kolka while they were touring with Grand Prix Wrestling, and I met them in a gym. And I just, me and Glenn Kolka hit it off. He was hung over a ship from the night before. He was at Admirons and he didn't want to uh, ch change the plates and the weights because Kolka was like 300 pounds jacked at the time. And Ed and Christian were just two little skinny guys and nobody knew who they were then. It was, uh, I can't even remember what they were, Hard Sexton, Hardcastle, and uh, Christian Gage. Yeah. And uh, he said, we just stuck up a conversation and he's like, uh, do you want to uh, do you want to work out? I'm not changing plates with those guys because I was like 290 at the time and pretty jacked. And and he's like, yeah. So we just get talking. And he's like, you should get into the wrestling business, man. He's like, you're a big dude. I'm six five, I'm six six, and and uh, you know, 280, 290 pounds. And he's like, you should get into this. So he gave me a meal's number. And uh, back then there was no emails and that, so I actually sent a Polaroid over by mail. And like with a letter and uh, sent it to Emil with my phone number. And then he called me up and uh, he's like, yeah, you know something? I, I, think I, I think I could train you, you know? Uh, and uh, so I went over there and started training with him. But I just got taught, one, how to take a bump. Two, how to take a hip toss and a headlock. And how to throw a kick. And the worst punch in Canada. So it, where it was like potato on people in the throat the whole time. So, and then it was just bump, 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 bump and learn how to run the ropes. And then, okay, we're starting, you know, I was doing that on weekends and then it was right into the fire. But like you said, I learned more on the road then because there wasn't around here, there wasn't wrestling schools per se. And it wasn't the way into the business with guys like Emil that were old school promoters. And uh, he wasn't just training anybody for the money. If you didn't have a size and a look that he thought that, was going to make him money. He just wasn't taking anybody in. You think of the last three guys that he took in was myself, Brody Steele, Peter Smith, and wild man, Gary Williams. So there was, you know, he wasn't just taking anybody into the business. He wanted big guys that looked the part. Right. And, and, um, but I didn't learn like what I learned in that ring was nothing. It was when we got in the cars and I was very fortunate. I got to travel with Angel Acevedo, the original Cuban assassin, the beast, you know, Leo Burke, uh, Roger Taro, the second butcher Vachon, who was around for years, uh, all these guys that had all this experience and, uh, would teach me uh, another guy that came down from Ontario that year was Chuck Sims. 
and Chuck Sims, you know, taught me a lot. He was so fun to be around and he'd teach you something in like a super funny way that you would remember it. So yeah, I was super lucky to be a part of, like you said, the last territory, the last part where we were doing it seven days a week and twice on Sunday, right? We had the double loop and uh, we would do the loop and do double shots on Sunday in Cape Breton. And, you know, it was, you know, you were bitching about it at the time, not bitching about it, but like, like, oh, I'm sore, it's day 50. But, you know, now I think every wrestler in the world would kill to be able to go back to those times where you got to work seven days a week and you got to learn how to work because you couldn't do all these crazy high spots seven nights a week. And you learned how to work a crowd and you learn psychology and, to be able to learn from guys like Leo Burke and the Cuban and the beast, the guys who taught the Bret Hart's about psychology, you know, and, and it, it, we were pretty fortunate here in the Maritimes to, uh, to have all that, you know, I got, I was so blessed to break in when I did, like, I, I, I couldn't imagine breaking into, and then this isn't a knock, but I couldn't imagine breaking into wrestling now and having the passion that I have now because of the way I came in and, got to be on the road seven days a week and that brotherhood and, you know, that fellowship. And, you know, back then it was different. We were protecting the business. We weren't, you know, everything was kayfabe, kayfabe, kayfabe. Right. So, well, I can remember even when, even when we were doing those, those first raw tours or whatever, there would be towns still on the East coast that still lived under that old school mentality where we would pull in. Right. And, Literally, you had no, I can remember, I don't remember the city or anything like that, but I can remember a couple of times, I think I ended up having to work the friggin' giant um, that time. And, and, and we literally had different dressing rooms. And the yep. important part was they were on opposite sides of the fucking building. So we had to like sneak out, go outside around the building to try to like figure out who it was. Cause we didn't even have a card at that time. Who the hell are we working tonight? It yeah. was absolutely crazy. Like, but these are the things, these are the things that, you absolutely have to go through T people talk about being on the road and having that badge. Like it is totally a badge of honor because listen, sure. anybody could go out and play wrestling on the weekends and stuff like that. But what you did was you jumped right into the fire and turned it into a job. It yeah. wasn't a hobby that you were hoping one day would be your job. It automatically became your job, right? I was all in. And I was, like I said, I was very fortunate to start at that time. And that's right. When all the, most of the territories were dying and there were only a few left at the time. So there was still Mexico, Puerto Rico and England where you could wrestle full time, but there was only so many spots. Like people talked about how many, there's so few spots that were going on with WCW and WWE, but under that next layer of full-time wrestlers in those big territories like Mexico, Puerto Rico and England, there was also a few spots where you could work full time and make a living and and those spots were competitive too and it was the side of the business where it was not only did you have to have a look not only did you have to be able to work but you had to be good on the road because there were guys that were incredible workers but couldn't handle the road right i think we've seen that uh, the first tour we came down we brought a guy down who couldn't from Ontario and uh, he couldn't handle the road. You know, he was girlfriend sick. He was home. actually, I think we had a couple, we had a couple that wandered off in the middle of the night on those raw tours that, you know, that was their first time on the road and, and they just couldn't handle being on the road. They couldn't handle the ribbon. They couldn't handle the, 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 the traveling. They couldn't handle the being up till seven in the morning, you know, and then sleep for two hours and then, go to the next town, go to the gym, go to the arena, start all over again. Right. So they could, they, could, they couldn't handle the guys in the back of the van, uh, constantly having to take a piss and the guys in the front of the van are like, screw you. No, we're not pulling over. So they just piss in a bottle. They couldn't handle a giant constantly playing Natalie fucking imbruglia every step <laughs> of the way they could like, there's a lot of little <laughs> tiny, little tiny things that just come along with it. Right. So yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned Puerto Rico and you mentioned Mexico, and I know you spent some time in Puerto Rico. How did that come about for you? So I, when, uh, when the ter the territory here in the Maritimes, kind of fizzled out between two, on 2002 because what happened, the same thing that always happens in the Maritimes, but people don't learn from it, is as soon as the product starts doing good and the territory starts doing good, 
some other schmuck wants to come in and try to run the same towns. Mm -hmm. And what most people don't realize is these are small markets and there's only so many wrestling fans. Now it's good. You get 600 to a thousand people in all of this. So you get good quality wrestlers in and everything, but then all of a sudden two people are trying to run and you're splitting that crowd. Now nobody's making money. And then when people start losing money, the promoters start bringing in shittier wrestlers and then the quality of wrestling goes down and then the fans stop going. And then it takes three to five years to rebuild the territory and the fans faith and wrestling again. So that's what happened in, in 2002 in the Maritimes. Uh, Bobby Bass started running a promotion Real action wrestling, and that kind of fizzled out. But I was fortunate enough with having a, a look then. I had my long hair and big, wild looking beard. And, you know, like I said, I was 6'6, 290. So England uh, became an option for me. And they were working anywhere from nine to 12 shows a week. And uh, I got to go over there, and the talent was incredible. So I was there with James Mason, Robbie Brookside. American Dragon, Brian Danielson, and I lived together for six months at uh, Micah Hearn's place, one of the warriors from the, the uh, Gladiators series there, the American Gladiators. Yeah, we lived at his place and did three months, and then we both went away for a bit, came back, did another three months, and Nigel McGuinness and Gangrel, and the list just goes on and on. Uh, PN News, you know, all these guys. It was, it was just like a the band of, you know, up and coming and older misfits and everybody that didn't really fit in, you know, anywhere at the time, but we're all great workers and put on great shows and we're just great guys to be on the road. So I went over there for Brian Dixon. I did um, three months with him Then I came home, went and did another three, came home for, I think a month, went back for another three months, went back, I came home for Christmas, went back for another three months again. And I didn't finish the three months because uh, Bushwhacker Luke and Brian Dixon, the promoter in England, had worked together for a long time. And Brian called him and he said, you know, mate, you got any big guys over there? I need a big villain. I need a big nasty. I need somebody that's going to smash people. And, you know, and and uh, he goes, yeah, I got you here. And he goes, uh, what's he look like? And he sent me the pictures and he goes, uh, he looks like Brody. He's the size of Brody. We're going to bring him in like Brody, right? And, and uh, I uh, I knew who Bruiser Brody was, but I didn't really know all the intricate details to his demise at the time, right? Right, right exactly. <laughs> so uh, Bushwhacker Luke uh, calls me and he says, mate, you know, we want you to come in at this time. We have this big pay-per-view judicial finale. We're going to start you that night. You're going to run in in the main event. And he goes, we're going to, we're going to do this uh, whole thing like you're the son of Brody, like the son of Sam. We're going to call you that. You're going to come in and get revenge back on those Puerto Ricans that killed your dad. And we're going to, we're going to run all this. And I was just like, yeah, sure. I'm going to Puerto Rico. I'm making good money. I'm staying on the beach. I got short drives, huge houses. Like we were doing our small towns were 5,000 a night and our big towns were 20,000 a night in the ball stadium. So number one rated TV in Spanish culture at the time. We, so I was like, yeah, sign me up. I'm in. And then um, I get there. Time goes by. I finished up with Brian and then came home, cleaned, packed, went to Puerto Rico, and I get off the plane, and I go to the house or whatever. And uh, the first night, was went for a walk on the beach, walked into the middle of a ghetto, could have been shot, like – crazy debauchery that first night but then i get to the arena the next night and uh, i walk into the locker room and there's everybody's there all speaking spanish and uh, the only i think people that spoke english that were white was april hunter was there her boyfriend slick wagner brown and chet the jet Jablonski, and casey james had came in a couple hours after i did so I walk in, we don't know anybody. I'm just going around shaking hands, trying to be polite. And then I go over and I shake this guy's hand and he just starts screaming. He's like, Savio, Savio, I no work with this Canadian. He looked at me like he's seen a ghost because I had like the big, long, curly hair, the big beard. Yeah. And uh, he goes running in the office. And then um, Luke 
and Salvio kind of waved me in and they're like, and I hadn't met Salvio yet. So I uh, walked me in the office and they're like, Luke's like, mate, mate, we got to change the plan. There's no son of Brody thing. We got, we got to change the plan. I didn't tell you. I said, didn't tell me what? And he goes, when we were doing the build up for this thing, mate, he goes, they were asking Savio questions about Invader and he called Invader a murderer. So, so, so Invader suing him and they settled because WWC was, uh, doing shit houses at the time, 200 or 300 in a 10,000 seat stadium that looked terrible. So they settled the lawsuit that Invader, because of his ego, wanted to come work in front of the big house. So they were in the middle of all that, and they kind of forgot about my gimmick coming in. So, <laughs> so, so Davio and them were like, well, we can't do this. We can't have son of Brody now with the real Invader here. You know, it, it was just kind of distasteful, right? So I'm sitting there. I'm supposed to go out. I had this whole... I'd practice to work like Brody, be like his clone for like the last couple of months. And uh, I said, well, what the fuck am I going to do then, Luke? Like, like uh, I'm yeah. here. We're yeah, going on. Here, right? And uh, he's looking at the newspaper. It's sitting in his office. And there's a thing like it's like a there was like a pack suicide of teenage kids that hung themselves. And he's like. Mate, we're going to say you're Hangman Hughes, and you're not going to say you hung those kids, but just kind of insinuate it. <laughs> okay, so you went, you went from showing up on the island looking for revenge, looking for the murderer of your father, to, no, no, there's a better idea. I'm the guy that hung a bunch of children. <laughs> in Puerto Rico. <laughs> I love Luke. Luke is the fucking best, man. <laughs> he is. And it was just a matter of that just happened to be on, on the paper. Like when he looked down, I was like, what are we going to do to fix this? And he's like, yeah, this, <laughs> I'm like, I don't care, man. We'll, we'll make it work. And, you know, I just want it to be, I got there in the stadium full Roberto Clemente stadium, my first night in and it's packed and all these talented guys are in the locker room, right? Conan's in there and Billy Gunn and everybody, you know, it's a pretty talented roster. I'm like, I thought I was like, I'm going home tomorrow. My, my stick's gone, right? Because of right. some stupid lawsuit. And then I did, I ended up, I ended up staying there for two years. Yeah, it was, it was, it was crazy. Like it was, I came home for, I left Puerto Rico and I went to the German tournament in Hanover for a couple of weeks. And other than that, I just came right back home. And the only reason I left then was because the Olympics were on that year and it was 2004. And that our TV show was canceled for those two weeks. So they didn't want to keep everybody in there. They were paying for TV. So they said, you guys can go home for vacation. And then Hanover called and they went to Hanover, did that tournament, which was incredible. Dave Taylor, Rick Steiner, you know, Robbie Brookside, Kendo Kashin. It was just one of the super, again, one of the big things in history. If you're in pro wrestling is the German catch tournaments, right? Like, it, 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 incredible experience there but then right back from there right to puerto rico and um yeah some of it puerto rico is the best but yet the wildest and craziest back at that time like the fans are so passionate they're sold out all the time but you know you come in and if you're a heel and you go to that baseball stadium, you, if you don't get in that dugout and you don't get to the first base or the third baseline before you turn around and do your gaga and your bullshit, then you're going to get hit with rocks, piss cups, spark plugs, batteries, you know, these little lines. There's, they'd sell these little lines on a stick. The guy'd be out in front and he'd be like holding them out like this in front of the, Car and I was driving in one day, and I said, "What the hell? Who's going to eat those things?" They're, they're, I thought he was selling them for people to eat outside the stadium. And uh, Luke's like, "You'll be eating one of those later, mate." And I didn't clue in, right? I was like, <laughs> sure, and "Sure enough, I get out, and I just get pelted with these limes." Uh, we're leaving. I'm like, "Run over that prick that's selling those limes!" Right? But, right? But, it's it's crazy, like how it gets like. Um, almost like tribal for fans like that though. Right. I can remember one time I'm working, 
I'm working a, a show on a reservation. And of course, I'm working with Tatanka at the time, right? And yeah. we're out there and it's just, it's it's packed. It's fantastic. We're doing the thing. And I'm it's right out the gate and I'm getting heat on him and just jump and beat him up around and I'm kicking him and he's down and stuff like that. And then start doing your bullshit to the crowd. And all of a sudden they start flicking lit cigarettes. Nice. And, and everybody <laughs> had it in the ring. And I'm like, all right, boom. And I just kind of let him know. I'm like, brother, just be careful. They're flicking, they're throwing lit cigarettes in the ring. And he looks up at me. He goes, that means we got him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's best. I yeah. remember Bison Smith and I, one night we were coming out of an arena and I used to, one of the guys down there, Spectro, he was a great guy, Puerto Rican guy, and he said to me, he goes, you're going to need some weight in that noose. I had this big one-inch rope that I had as a noose, but he said that's not heavy enough. So he took some met like copper and wound it into the knot to add weight to it. So it was like probably seven, eight-pound knot on the end of that that had wire roped into it. So Bison and I were leaving one night, and Bison had the rope with the big cowbell on it. And the two of us are... 300 pounds jack you know just full of it at the time and we're just we come into this door and everybody just swarms us and me and bison are back to back with the rope and like and then it's we're just swinging and rocks are coming in and you hear gunshots going off in the back of the parking lot and like things were just wild and i remember they they got us out of the venue they put us in the ambulance and they drove us to the next town because they couldn't get us out and Bison and I are in this little phone booth of a bathroom hiding because the people are out like searching for us and mobs. And we're in the bathroom there, the shittiest toilet, the 105 degrees out, but we're like touching each other in here with this rope and this cowbell. And the two of us were just quiet for a minute. And he just looked at me and he goes, this is awesome, brother. We got them. We're going to sell that place out next week. <laughs> right? That's the thing. You're sitting here thinking to yourself, this is the greatest time of my life. We yeah. did it. Where's there, my Oscar? <laughs> there, there's a night, and you watch it on YouTube. Uh, it's at people that watch it. On YouTube, there's a thing. It's IWA Savio Vega's return. And we did this big angle where it paid off. And we're in Bimon, and there's like 12,000 people jammed into there. And you can see, if you watch it, watch what goes on the ring the first time and then watch the crowd behind it. They're on their feet and the whole thing bouncing. And it was so loud in there. Like it was like those Westerns where you see the heat waves. Mm -hmm. Like it was that loud that you couldn't see straight. The whole place was vibrating. And I remember we did this thing, Savio clears the ring and we all take bumps on the floor and their people are throwing the chairs in. So the crowd... I don't know. I didn't get it because Savio's in the ring. He just cleared house, but they start throwing chairs and everything starts getting thrown into the ring and around the ring and at the wrestlers that he just cleared house and we're selling on the outside of the ring. So I'm lying there and me and Bison are beside each other and Chet Jablonski. We're like, this is how you do it, brother. We're, we're selling this fucker out. We're going to, we're, we're, we're going to run with this forever. And as we're lying there and we're just kind of giving a fist bump while we're selling lying down, this machete comes sailing through and lands between the two of us. And we're like, okay, brother, time to get a chair and get out of here. <laughs> yeah, right. There's still lines to this shit, right? You got to be we, careful what you're throwing in. Right. And we were just so like, every, I tell people, normal people that, and they're like, you love the fact that people, there is 12,000 people throwing chairs and knives at you. I was like, I knew we were going to have a house next week. I'll tell you that for sure. So if you yeah. can, always the biggest thing in in professional wrestling and this is one of the things like i talk about when people ask me oh what was it that got you into it or whatever and for me for me it was going to awa shows right yeah. and i remember specifically being at an awa show jimmy snooker is working a match out there and he was in the middle of a middle of a feud with colonel de beers and de beers comes running out jumps snooker from behind or whatever pulls him out to the outside pulls the padding up on the floor uh yeah. gives him the fucking you know the old kabuki on the floor snooker fucking comes up just fucking covered in blood they bring out the ambulance the stretcher they haul him off and i'm watching this I'm watching this happen and it wasn't so much the act of what was happening, but then I started watching the crowd as a kid and I'm like, Oh, that's, yeah. that's what this is. That's, that's what it's all about. And that's what I loved about Puerto Rico is the fans were so passionate. 
and a lot of them still believe like it was it was so crazy the one of the angles they did down there is uh ricky banderas they put him in a coffin and burnt him alive and they did this gimmick where he like kind of disappeared or whatever and it happened right before i got there but they kept doing this thing that he was coming back from the dead so they would have on the big screen like this fog and they'd show his face and that and I'm looking at Roberto Clemente Stadium, and this place was air horns and crackling and going nuts and hopping. To his face appears, and the whole place goes quiet when people start crying, like because they think he's coming back from the dead, right? And I'm like, oh my god, this is like crazy. And they so and we teased that and built it till he came back. And when he came back, like the roof just blew off the place. It, and like is those long angles, right? That you get in territories that you get to see the fruit of building them over courses of months that you can't really do with a lot of shows. Now you don't, you can't keep them strung along like we did. So yeah, it, some of the stuff down there, it was, it was the, my favorite part of my career. I've been fortunate. I, I got to work for new Japan. I got to work in Korea. I got to work in India, but Puerto Rico was, it was the spot where you were doing big TV, same as WWE or any of those places. Or Savio ran TV, him and Miguel Perez, exactly the same as WWE. We were running huge buildings and having big houses. The crowds weren't only there, but they were crazy into it. And we had short drives. We only had the, the island that you can drive one way or the other, and it's only, it's only like two hours your longest drive. We had a condo on the beach on Isla Verde with a pool right on. If you see a postcard of Puerto Rico, that beach they always show, that was right in front of our house. Yeah. So, you know, it, it was wrestler's paradise to be down there. And the other thing is we always had so much talent coming in. You got to work with some of the great wrestlers that, like, every, every other weekend there would be a different – the, the Samoans had come in. So there'd be Tonga Kid, Rikishi, Black Pearl, the other brother, the only brother that doesn't seem to be on WWE TV right now, Black Pearl. <laughs> and, uh, and, but all those um, Samoans would come in and you'd sit down and learn from those guys. Tonga Kid and Rikishi have been back from the territory days through to the WWE days. So you got to learn just even if you took one piece from that and added it to what you were doing. and and, you know, you put some stuff back here for, you know, which is paying off now running my own promotion and stuff. But there would be all there would be a good wrestlers coming in. Billy Gunn, Conan, Vampiro, um, you know, Ron Killings was in a lot of the time during that era. Uh, it was. Well, just, I, well, I know of one guy. I know of one guy that you did spend some time down there with intimately so to speak a good yeah. friend a good friend of mine as well one mr jerome young some people know him as new jack and i mean you know because puerto rico always had a way with like pushing that pushing that uh that line pushing the yeah. envelope, right bringing in the hardcore stuff and and everybody knows at that time you know what i mean hardcore was just getting its infancy so to speak but it was getting over he was getting yeah. over huge and i mean jack was jack was always one of these guys to me he was an anomaly because if you knew jack if you knew jack or if you knew jerome that was different than knowing new jack you know what i mean and you get and and you spend some time with them and you find out oh they are kind of a little bit of a different person but at Very the same different. time at the same time they're both a little fucking crazy tell me about oh, your new jack they're both so they're both crazy. The first time I met New Jack down there, New Jack was coming down because, you know, Puerto Rico is the land of blood and gut. Like, right. it's where all the hardcore stuff stemmed from. If you go back in time, ECW guys, they took everything. The sheep herders, and believe it or not, most people that don't know much about the bushwhackers and before that, there were they were the original hardcore guys with barbed wire and fire, and they did all their stuff in Puerto Rico. So for places that like love blood and guts we had new jack and balls mahoney coming in uh homicide was coming in and doing some hardcore stuff down there with them too and madman pondo was coming down you know and uh so jack and i the first time it was a bit of a feeling out process for jack and i 
you know, I'm a big guy. He doesn't quite really know who I am. He's going to try to test me. I'm not fucking being tested, right? But we sorted it out. We uh, sorted it out. He realized I wasn't backing up, and he realized, well, he's pretty fucking big, you know, and the rest of the guys respect him. So, you know, maybe I won't test these waters at the time. But anyway, we went out that first weekend. We went out into the bars, everything. Everything was cool. And then he went away and then we brought him back a little later and we were having, it was a big weekend. They brought in Viscera, um, Balls Mahoney, New Jack, and there were some other guys there. I think Billy Gunn and some of those guys were there too. So what we usually did on a big pay-per-view weekend is Wednesday night would be a smaller town. Thursday night would be a smaller town. Friday would be a bigger show like Ponce. We'd finish in Bayamon, which is the or the Roberto Clemente Stadium, and then we would do a smaller show on Sunday. So the first night we came in, everybody had their angles kind of set out, but so we were doing a, a six man to kind of tease everything that was going to happen later, where everybody would get their thing in. So it was me, Balls Mahoney, and I think. Me, Balls, Mahoney, and I can't remember if Savio was on the outside. Yeah, it was me, Balls, Mahoney, and Bison, and Savio was on the outside versus New Jack. It was New Jack, Savio was Babyface at the time, and Viscera. So we're able back, we're doing, like, going to work out stuff. New Jack didn't want to talk about anything. I said, okay, cool. I'm good with that. I don't, I don't need the – Sure. Yeah. Sure. So – we said, we're going to start off outside. We're going to brawl around the arena. And he said, and we'll just go from there. I said, fine. So Jack's leaning over his bag of 5,000 weapons that he always takes with him, right? Yeah. And he's got this staple gun, and he pulls it out, and all this dried blood flakes off the staples. It's like a dust coming off the thing. And I'm like, what the fuck is that, Jack? And he's like, Oh, it's just blood, man. I like to sit here and sweat, just bleed into my bag afterwards. And I'm like, why? You know, <laughs> so, like, you got so just as we're going out through the curtain, Jack says, okay, hang man, I'm going to take this and I'm going to staple this dollar bill to your face in your cheek. And I said, not with those bloody staples, you're not. Right, and he goes, no, no, it's my thing. I said, well, it's not my thing. You're not putting a dirty, bloody staple on my face. And so we were kind of, and then our music hits, and we go out. So we go out, and I pair off with Viscera, and we're brawling and brawling. And Jack wants to get the staple gun thing in the first, so he posts Balls of Mahoney, gets the staple gun. He tells Viscera to hold me. So. Viscera is holding me with my arms behind me. And I said, Nelson, I said, I'm not fucking taking this. And Jack's coming towards me, like, with the dollar bill and the staple gun up. I said, I'm not taking a fucking bloody staple, Nelson. And I kind of pinched down on Nelson, and I kicked the staple gun out of Jack, Jack's hand. So, But I caught him in the hand. So now he's pissed. He didn't get the kid in. He didn't get the thing in. So he comes over and he's grabbing and we start brawling. And then he was like kind of being a little uncooperative. So I just shoot, pick him up and like threw him on the guardrail and over the guardrail on the other side. So he got hot about that. I was like, he's like, you're not taking this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he's bitching me out. So I throw him into the ring and we all go back in the ring now to settle down and go to the corners. So I go into Jack and. I go to grab him. He reach, He kicks me in the hand. So now I'm fucking mad. So he's wearing the camouflage covered jumpsuit. Mm-hmm. And I just reach down and grab him like by the ass and the back of the neck by the jumpsuit and just like pick him up and like fire him. So he's hot. Now Savio's like, like, don't be shooting. Just fucking get to your corners. Tag out, tag out. So we tag out. They go through the rest of the match. And, um, we come back, we do this finish and whatever. So we get in the back and Nelson comes in first, Viscera. And he's like, man, what, what was that? And I was like, I'm not taking a staple gun in the face. And me and Nelson, he's like, yeah, but Jack's going to be pissed. He's He thinks he's got more seniority than you and you should do what you're told. And I said, I'm not getting stapled in the face with a bloody, dirty staple gun. 
yeah. or nothing. Like it didn't mean anything. There was no payoff. Like there was nothing between us. And then Balls comes in and he's yelling at me. He's got his chair and he's yelling, you should respect New Jack, blah, 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 and all this. And I was like, fuck off, Balls. Like, I'm not taking this shit. If you guys want to cut yourself to ribbons, you guys go ahead, but I'm not doing it for nothing. And then Jack comes in and Jack's got this knife with uh, got the knuckles. brass knuckles on it with the spine <laughs> one, and, one, yeah. <laughs> and the chain. And he's coming in, he's pointing it at me and he's fucking yelling. And, you know, do you, you know, do you know who I am? And what got what I thought was funny is like, I've worked for ECW and CZW. And he said CZW and I laughed. I just started snorting. Like, I was like, really? I just, I just got back from New Japan and the German <laughs> tournament. And, and, and you're hitting me with, I worked for CZW. Like, you know, and he's like, you know, you're not used to working with wrestlers like me. I said, no, I'm used to working with like Robbie Brookside, James Mason, guys that can work, work, you know, Dave Taylor those guys rick steiner right. and uh he just got mad and he's like got the knife to my face and and so viscer and all them are just like stay sorry mike say you're sorry so i said here i am back in the corner remember i was supposed to be brought in as bruiser brody son. i'm now in a shower with a knife you know up to my face so i said all right then i'm sorry i'm sorry and uh then everybody get out of the dressing room and uh, Ricky Banderas comes out of the shower. He's standing in the shower the whole time. And he's got like a straight edge razor. And he's like, why'd you say you're sorry? He had a knife to my face. There's three of them. There's only one of me. He goes, I had your back. I didn't know you were back there. <laughs> right? So, so anyway, it was pretty hot tension in the, in the locker room. And everybody kind of knew what happened. So Jack. We got put, we came together in the same car, Jack and I, but they left us in separate cars to go. And we finished up. We stayed away from each other the rest of the weekend. There was a lot of tension in the locker room. And then um, a week went by, uh, New Jack went home, and we were building up for another big show at the end of the month. And Luke calls me up, and he's like, mate, mate, uh, the fans seen that you and Jack were, like, shooting on each other. They want you two to uh, – they want you two to do like a cage match. And I was like, yeah, okay. I said, and I'm kind of, I'm still pissed off. I'm butthurt. Cause I said, I was sorry when I wasn't like, it's eating at me, eating at me. So I said, said, I'll do it, but he's not wearing those coveralls where he can hide a whole bunch of blades. Cause you have to remember, he just stabbed that guy like 16 times two weeks before he came down. Right. And then the whole gypsy Joe thing and the, it's mass transit thing. All these things are in the back of my head, right? So we, uh, I said, I'll go do it. You put him in a pair of black tights and you put me in a black tights and you put us in a cage and let's see who comes out. And he's like, mate, mate. He goes, we're not selling the UFC here. We're selling the thing. I was like, I don't trust him. I said, I don't trust him. He could stab me with anything. We already don't like each other now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going in. I said, you put us in plain black tights, no weapons. I'll go out and I'll fight New Jack any day, any time like this. And uh, he goes, mate, that ain't going to work. So he hangs up. And now everybody knows we don't like each other. And they know I'm. this is eating at me more. And uh, so we get into the dressing room the next day. And we were in Cogwas the first night. And we walk in. And I walk in and I look at the booking sheet. Now, Madman Pondo is in on this trip. So I look at the booking sheet and it says Hangman and Pondo versus Slash Venom and New Jack. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so I came up and I look at the. Everybody else came and looked at the booking sheet. Everybody's gathered around looking at the booking sheet, and the place is dead quiet. Now, Puerto Rican locker room is never quiet. Right. And everybody just looks back and looks at me, and they're just kind of nodding and. Uh, and I was like, okay. And I walk up, look at the booking sheet, and it's me versus you know versus Jack and, and the tag team. And I just went, okay. And it was dead quiet in that locker room the whole night. So Jack looked at the booking sheet, and he just looked back at me. And we're sitting down. He's going through all his weapons. So the guy down there named Chicano, and great guy, friggin', uh, he always had surgical scalpel on him like the whole handle and everything 
So I said, all right, well, this is going to happen. So I took, I got a steel tube around piece of steel tube and put the scalpel blade in there and I put it in my boot. And when I put it in my boot, Shane Sewell, um, Palio, all the other guys seen it and Jack seen it and Jack was loading up. And so everybody was like, this is gonna, this is gonna go down. This is gonna, so I'm getting, you know, ready for this match. I went, I walked by Luke. I said, if you wanted it, you're going to get it. You know? And it was like, I, I told you like, but if you want it, you're going to get it. And, uh, I went up to the locker room to get in the shower, to wet my hair. And I was getting ready to go out and I turn around and here's Jack standing in the shower behind, like coming into the shower behind me. And again, I'm thinking, there we go. Bruce yeah. Road. Right. It, it, it's, it's going on right now. Here it is. You know? So I turned around and Jack says to me, he goes, Mike, uh, he goes, uh, I don't have many places to work anymore. He goes, there's very few places where I can get booked anymore. He goes, this is one of the last places that paid me well. He goes, you and I don't have to like each other. He goes, but we have to work there. And I said, I don't fucking trust you. I don't trust you at all. Uh, you know, you know, I'm, you bring your shit, I'll bring mine. And if you try to fuck me, it, it's on. And he said, well, how about this? He goes, I won't touch you. He goes, I'll work with Fondo. You work with Slash. We don't touch each other. And I said, all right, fair enough. So then Slash walks into the, the, the dressing room. And so I'll tell the second part of the story, and then I'll rewind back to what happens next. Okay. So we go, uh, we go out for the match now. People just see us walking out. It's a sellout at the curtain, right? Like the place has been quiet. Nobody said a word. It's a sellout at the curtain. So we go out. We do the match. We stayed away from each other the whole night. So the finish is the end of the first baseline. The ring truck was parked at the end of the first baseline. New Jack was going to climb up onto that. And then he was going to jump down on the pondo on the table, go through the table. And then the pinfall was going to be there. They tied me up with my noose, my own noose on the ring post or whatever. So the finish goes off. Madman Pondo's hip pops out right out of place, dislocates. Right? I don't, if you know the gimmick, you know the gimmick, right? So, <laughs> so, so it pops out, and his foot's like rolled backward. Yep. So we come in the back and um, come in the dressing room, and I'm like, fuck you, New Jack. You got to get your fucking shit in. You got, you didn't, we didn't have to do that dive off the top. This is fucking bullshit. Pondo can't feed his family now because of you. He's going to be out with that hip for a long time. You know, this is bullshit. And he goes, fuck you. And he goes over and he's got the knife and he's coming across the dressing room at me. And I'm coming at him and we're coming like across at each other. And then Splash comes in and he has a kendo stick and he fires it between me and New Jack. And he starts yelling at New Jack. He's like, New Jack, you fucking piece of shit. Because, uh, Pondo and Slash are from Indiana and they're buddies or whatever. And uh, he's like, fuck you. And uh, New Jack pulls up the knife. And I was like, fuck you, New Jack. And we're all, everybody's meeting. All of a sudden, Palio and all the young referees and the guys all pull the guns out. And all the guns go right to New Jack. And one of the guys is standing behind him with the knife. And New Jack just goes white as a ghost. And he's like, uh, uh, and then we turn around and now I'll go back to where we were when we first locked in after Jack and I had that discussion earlier and, and uh, flash came in flash goes, listen, all the boys are waiting for you two to kill each other. He goes, let's rib them. He goes, we're going to do this. You guys stay away from each other. He goes, cause I know you are going to just piss each other off and it's going to go bad. But after we do the finish, you guys go like you're pissed off at each other. He goes, Pondo can do this thing where he can dislocate his hip and move it around. So if he does that, the boys will take it serious, right? Because we'll get the ambulance to come out. So anyway, we did the whole thing. And at the end, we didn't know. So the, they all got the guns pulled out and the knife like up to New Jack. New Jack goes white. And then we go, gotchas. And they're like, what? Oh, <laughs> they didn't get the joke. <laughs> didn't get the joke. The boys wouldn't talk to me for two weeks. 
Shane Sewell was pissed. Uh, Palayo came up to me, could only speak like broken English, and he was one of the guys that had the gun. Oh my, he, for, my brother's dead now, so I, I'm not going to get him in any trouble, but he's like, I love you, man. Like, you are one of our brothers. You're, you're not a, a gringo like the rest of them. Like, we love you. I was going to kill that guy for you. And I was like, I love you, man. He's like, no, no, we can't talk. <laughs> yeah, no, we're, we're done. <laughs> He's like, I near killed that guy for you. And that was the thing about the Puerto Rican dressing room. We, uh, and I know because Ernie Sin has mentioned this in some of his talks about Puerto Rico. Everybody in that locker room has a gun except for you. <laughs> and yeah. everybody's, everybody's got these big hand cannons that like these guys in there with the gold plate at ones and, and it was just a different time. It was literally the wild west of wrestling, right? It's the same thing in Mexico too, though, right? Yeah. I mean, it's that, yeah. it's that, it's the connection outside of wrestling that you end up with that kind of hardware in your bag, right? Yeah, and it, it, it was, and it was one of those moments where everybody freaked out, and Luke went running out as soon as the gun. Luke ran out of the thing, and he's like, "Jay." you're gonna kill the business again. and he just took off and then he went and got savio and savio was like didn't know what was going on he came back and everybody was so mad at us because, well, sure. because you almost like <laughs> listen, they already had the fucking brody thing one more murder inside <laughs> of the company that's it it's done <laughs> so many people lose paychecks at that point yeah. We didn't realize that people were going to be pulling guns, though, right? We like it, that wasn't in the plan. We just thought we'd get to where we're near going to throw blows or stab each other, and then turn around and say, "I gotcha." But it's what's funny about that story is um, New Jack was so embarrassed that he was so scared, and of course he was scared. He had a whole bunch of guns, but he would not admit that he was scared. And uh, when Hannibal actually asked him about it on one of his interviews. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, you can't. <laughs> yes. I remember Flash playing again and Anarchy, the referee that was there at the time, and all the guys, they watched that and they're like, what do you mean he didn't forget? He didn't remember, but he just would not admit that he was scared. I'd be like, I shit my pants. Yeah. But the people had guns and knives pulled on me and I'm in Puerto Rico. Of course they shit my pants, right? What are you supposed to? It's funny you mentioned that, that knife because at the other end, um, at the other end of that chain from that knife, he just had a simple fork. Yeah. The, but on the other <laughs> end, right? Because I remember the first time, the first time I ever worked Jack, he shows I'm already in the dress room. He shows up at the dressing room and you know, promoter introduces the two of us. Cool, no problem. You guys are gonna be working together. I'm like, no problem. You go get yeah. situated, we'll figure stuff out, right? And he was already kind of in a fucking little bit of a mood. I, yeah. I get it. You know what I mean? And, and this is after you already hear all of the stories and stuff like that. Right. So, you know, what's going on. So you're like, okay. And he's going through his bag, same thing. And he pulls out this chain and he's got the, you know, the fork at one end, pulls that out first and starts pulling the chain. And then all of a sudden that, that knife comes out the curved with the, the knuckles and you're just going, the spikes. yeah, with the spikes <laughs> on the knuckles. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, huh, all right. Cool. Cause I mean, again, you know me, I'm six, four, two, 285, 290 pounds at the time. Like no problem. I can handle yeah. myself. Let's, but, but there's, there's lines. So there's still I, weapons too. Right. And I look over, I look over at one of the boys, uh, and, and I'm like, uh, you still got those knuckles on your bag. He's like, yep. I'm like, cool. Hand them to me. I put them in my pocket and we go out there and we do the thing. And as soon as we, you know, we start brawling a little bit out the gate, he shit cans me out. He comes out after me. Boom, smashes a beer bottle. And uh, I'm like, I'm like, here we go. Yeah. It's I, stick my, I stick my hand in my pocket and I pull them out and I've got them on, like slide them right on my hand. I've got them out and he can see that they're on there. And I'm looking up like this and he comes down soft as a baby's ass. Yeah. Like it's because he, he he was like, Oh, I can't take advantage of this, right? And 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 I was fine and we were fine and I would work. We had a nice conversation afterwards. He was like a lot of people, you know, don't know what to do, blah, blah, blah. You were great. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and we were fine. We would get together, you know, a lot of times we would have phone calls after that. And that's when you got to meet Jerome. Well, we went out after that whole thing, and we went out that night. And I want to say it was Mike Tyson versus Bruce Seldon. I could be wrong, on the, but we went and watched the Mike Tyson fight at the bar together. And everybody, like, could, like we legitimately went from we're going to kill each other, yeah, like, probably four hours earlier that night. So we went out and had a bar. 
but I will always say, like, the, the problem with Jack was his substance abuse, and you never knew which Jack you were getting, right? Like, I see Balls Mahoney was one of his closest friends, and I seen him try to peel his head off just because he forgot a spot, you know, like, with, and so you, and it was always if he was under the influence. If you got Jack, happy go lucky Jack, and you're traveling, you know, two or three hours. And you're sitting there goofing around with Jack. He's the greatest guy in the world. But then sometimes he forgets there's a difference between new Jack, this character, right. and the cutting people. And I, I think the more that people talk to him about the the mass transit thing and all the other stuff, and he starts to he gets more agitated about him. And so uh, you're driving, and some of the young guys are asking him, "I'm like, would you guys shut the fuck up?" Like you can see him changing, right? As we yeah. as you're going, so. Yeah, no, it, it, I'm glad we ended that because there was a month there where there was so much tension in that locker room with me and him. And it was just, and that's the thing, a lot of people, uh, a big change between territory wrestling and guys just doing it on the weekend for fun. The, when you're going into a territory and there's only few spots to do it full time for a living, uh -huh. there are times when you walk into a territory somebody that's in that territory home territory their friend had to go home and is not getting paid now so you just took one of their friends jobs so the first two weeks that you're in a territory like that nobody really cares if you get hurt in those first two weeks and guys are gonna potato you up they're gonna test you to see if you're gonna fight back and you know if my friend's sitting at home now because of you well, we're not giving you the job that easy. Yeah. And so, you know, a couple of guys in England, like some guys that were shooters would try to stretch you. You'd have to fight back. Same thing happened in Puerto Rico. A lot of guys and a lot of egos, the big guy get in. Like me and uh, Apollo, who's one of my closest friends in wrestling. And we had, when we first got together down there, neither we didn't cooperate with each other at all. Like we'd be out there stiff punching each other and, we didn't realize we were getting worked by the office. The um, at the time I was three hundred pounds and jacked, and Apollo was three hundred pounds and jacked, and I was going out there, and they were saying, "Don't give them nothing. Don't sell anything. We're going to start pushing you strong, monster heel." And they said, uh, "You're going to eventually go up and work with Ricky, a good chain, and then Ricky, and you know we're going to put you over by you beating Apollo." And then they go tell Apollo. Don't sell anything for him. You know, we're, we're going to give you a push. You know, we want to see. And then everybody would sit at the curtain and watch to see what happened. And now, meanwhile, he thinks that I'm not selling for him. Well, he's supposed to be getting a push and I'm supposed to be. And I think that he's not doing the same for me. So the two of us are out there. We're Nobody's selling for anything. And we're hitting harder and hitting harder. And we're both getting pissed off. And then he... He caught me right on the chin with one. It kind of stunned me for a second. I went down, and he hopped on me, and then we started rolling and really fighting, and then they kind of pulled us apart. We get in the back, and we go back, and we're yelling at each other. We're going to fight out in the back, and he goes. And then all of a sudden, Luke comes out, and Luke's standing there, and he's like, you're the most fucking marks. He goes, <laughs> he goes, we just want to test you. I'm like, and me and Paul are like, test us? We're just gonna kill each other, like yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, "Now I just want to see if, he, if they were testing me to see if I'd fight back. They're testing Apollo to see if he wouldn't give an inch. So if they were gonna give him a push at some time, that he wouldn't let anybody." And you know, I was like, well, "That that's the difference, right?" And territory wrestling and that old school thing to where I find now everybody's like, "Hey, you know, uh, we're all buddies, playtime, you know," and it's. And uh, they forget about the business side of it so much, right? Because it's good to be competitive with people and, and really push people. I think it brings out the best in you. And especially when you're fighting for a spa. Like, right. If I'm not doing my part here to push the other people to have good matches, to sell tickets, to you know put asses in the stands, then I'm going to get sent home tomorrow, right? It, it, every... Every payday is also the day that you might get fired if they don't feel like you're you're yeah. pulling your weight, right? So yeah. it's, it's always good to have that, I don't know, carrot dangling in front of you or a shark tank swimming under you, right? But it's... 
it's it's, it's uh, one of the, it's one of the weird things. I can't tell you how many locker rooms nowadays I've walked into, and they're like, "Okay, this this," and I'm like, the first thing I'll say to them, I'm like, "Okay, what what's the business of it?" Yeah, and they look at they look at you like, "Huh? What are you talking about?" It's like, "Oh, fuck me." Okay, yeah. like you don't you don't you're not understand what's the why are we doing this? What's the business end of this? You you want me to do this fucking stuff, but why are we doing it? Let but me now. Now, basically, when I'm running my shows, I go in and I tell them the story that we're telling because yeah. I don't rely on them to do it because I know most of the guys are young and don't know. Right. So, before, you know, so I'm like, they don't understand how to do business. They don't understand how to do long term booking and they don't know how to tell a story within a story. Your match has to have a story that is part of the big picture of the story and the whole show that has to be part of our long-term plans of what we get planned six down, months down the road, but it has to be a piece of that puzzle. And you can't just put that piece of the puzzle anywhere. It fits in a spot and you have to be able to pull it off so that it all runs together. And I'll go in and I'll say, um, Hey, you guys are working tonight. And I'll ask them. Like, it's kind of like a, a teaching session. So I'm, okay. You got a big guy here and a little guy here. What are you guys going to do tonight? Oh, I'm going to bump him here and then I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. I'm like, no, you're not. No, you're not. I'm like, that makes no sense. You know, you're not doing all that. Plus you're in the second match, you know, so you're not doing all this. We're building this up to the end and they don't know. it. And it's funny because there's some people that do not want to work for me because they have to work professionally. Right. They want to be able to go in, do all their high spots, get all their moves in, they're open and match and they want to use tables and chairs and they want to do all the big high spots and 700 false finishes. But if I come in, I'm like, no, you're not doing that. This is what you're doing. You got this many false finishes. You got this much time. This is the story we're telling. And this is how we're opening the show. And then the next time they just like, no, they'll go work for somebody else. I'm like, I, and I'll teach them like where to be for TV, how to work a, hard camera you know what to do and they don't care they much sooner you know i'm like well that's the difference between people who want to learn to be able to do this for a living and want to be able to do it right and people that are just going out to tell their friends that i'm a wrestler and i'm going to do all these cool moves right and you know i think it's funny now today because um WWE has made the switch. Something that I'll be honest, I haven't watched until maybe a month ago, but they've switched to storytelling. So all these young guys are like, what I've been saying, storytelling, storytelling is the whole thing, you know? Yeah. And and they're they're like just starting to get it. Oh, because they're saying it now. Oh, we're telling stories now and WrestleMania weekend was so big and everything, you know, the business is picking up again. Well, it's picking up again because we're telling stories. And we're not just having spot fests anymore, right? So. But you know as well as I do that you can't tell a lot of these kids nowadays that they have to learn it from TV like everything else. Once the, once the WWE says it, oh, well, then it must mean something. Not the fucking guy who just got done telling stories about how he spent two years living in Puerto Rico with every star in the fucking world, right? Yeah. <laughs> and like I said, like been to New Japan, worked that whole style, yeah. worked English style, did Korea. So I got a lot of miles with some of the best, you know, guys in the world, right? Some of the best workers, the best promotions. And the thing that I always did when I traveled with these promotions is I went and sat in the office. Like at the end of my run in Puerto Rico, I was booking finishes for the undercard guy, you know, and I started being part of creative for like different storylines and stuff like that. So it would be Flash Flanagan, Luke. Savio, Miguel and I sitting in the office on Monday at the end of it and coming up with like finishes and stuff like that and where we were going to, you know, little skits and stuff like that for vignettes for TV. And so I got to do all that kind of stuff and being and Moody Melendez, you know, hooked up with all those guys and learned what they knew. And, you know, Brian Dixon, one of the best promoters ever and got to learn how he promoted town shows and, you know, yeah. how he worked his circuit and how he financed everything. And so, you know, for me right now, I'm just trying to pass that stuff down to the younger guys and provide an environment that's run professionally. And like, I'll sit and watch every match and I'll, you know, the guys, you know, the guys who want to learn because they'll come back. They know I watch every match and they'll come back and say, what did you think about this? And 
I'll say this was good. You had them here. You didn't have to do the next five things. If you had it went right there, it would have been perfect. So just keep that in your head for next time. And listen, don't always because you you know you you plan these three other moves afterwards. The crowd's only going to get so hot. So once you hear them hit there, just go home with it there. Don't you might lose them, right? So teaching guys that, and then the other guys will just walk by me, and not so much at my shows, but when I was booking some other shows in the area, and they just walk by me and. You know, at, at first I'd be like, hey, you know, in that match there, and they'd look at you with these blank eyes like they didn't give a shit. Yeah. And then they would just leave, and I'd be like, yeah, what do I know, right? You've got 10 matches. Like, what could I possibly have to common offer? Thing, you, right? the common thing I say inside of a locker room after something, it's like, yeah, but what the fuck do I know? Right? Uh, like, like, what the fuck do I know? <laughs> yeah. uh, and you can, and you, can you know, uh, I've, I've given up on the point of giving away free advice. Yeah. You know what I mean, if you come to me and you ask me a question, absolutely no problem. But to go out and give you unsolicited advice anymore to a lot of these young kids, I just I don't got the time for it. Fuck them. I don't yeah. either unless unless they're working for me and then if they're working That's for different. me, I I do it to see how they respond to it. And if right. they don't respond to it, then they're not on my show anymore. Cuz I I just want guys to to learn the business and be good people and good workers on my show and if they're not that they're not going to be sticking around, right? So well, it's it's funny you mentioned that because now it's almost kind of come full circle for you, right? Yeah. Because you've now become the promoter. You've now become uh, the the Emil Dupre. Exactly. Uh, and so you know, much like Emil. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, <laughs> you don't you don't quite have a son that's the same, anyways. Oh, thank God. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> thank that's God. A, that's that's an hour discussion all unto its own. We'll uh, save that one for next time. Uh, uh, yeah. That's not even worth discussing for me. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit. How did Red Rock uh, come about for you, and what made you decide to get into that field in the first place? So what happened with Red Rock was I was so disgusted by all the other promoters that when I came home and most of the other the territories, the full-time work was drying up. So Puerto R I left Puerto Rico – I dislocated and separated my shoulder at the end of 2005. Came home. I was really fortunate. I had just signed a deal with uh, Anoki Sports Management, which was running New Japan at the time. So I had the injury, and I thought I was going to have to miss out on a New Japan tour. But they sent me to L.A. to the dojo down there, and they did my rehab down there. So I stayed down there for a couple months, and it was good. Did the New Japan tours and stuff. Uh, and then England was drying up and I was like, okay, it looks like the territory system's dying now. So I'm going to have to switch to something else. So I went back to school, went back to school. I work as an addiction worker now and stuff like that and rehab. I have a physical rehab clinic that I run as well. So I get into more healthcare stuff, but I still had that itch for wrestling, but I was working for these other promoters on the weekends around here and they were just scumbags, like absolute scumbags. And uh, I just, I'm like, at this point in my life, I don't want to be around scumbags. Right. Like, I just can't be around these, you know, scuzzy, carny like people. Like, I just can't do it. It was just at that point in my life where before you could kind of justify it, oh, I need to do this to get experience, blah, 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 blah. But now I'm like, I want to run a wrestling promotion that um, is good old school quality wrestling. It's hard hitting like maritime traditional wrestling, right? It's old school, hard hitting. And I also want it to uh, use it as a tool to give back to the community. So we started doing a lot of fundraising work and working with a bunch of different charities and stuff. So that was the main reason. I, a lot of the, the rinks, the hotels, places around here were promoters that would come in. They'd come in, have a bad house, and then they'd leave. They wouldn't pay the hotels. They wouldn't pay the arenas and all this. So everybody hated wrestling, right? Like wrestlers were scumbags and yeah. promoters were scumbags, and nobody wanted anything to do with anything. So I had to come home and kind of put my personal reputation and name on the line. And I said, listen, give me a chance here. Let me run some shows. I'm not going anywhere. I live here. I'm not just pulling up the pegs and heading to the next town, right? Or going back to wherever, right? So 
you know, I had to regain some trust there with a lot of venues and a lot of sponsors and a lot of the, the media newspapers hadn't been paid, radio hadn't been paid. So had to kind of rebuild a lot of those bridges. And then I wanted to start working with charities. So, you know, the, we could also, not only that we weren't scumbags, but that we were good people too as well. And, uh, you know, the community has really got out and supported us. I think in the last 13 years, we've granted 12 wishes for Make-A-Wish and Children's Wish. We've, there's a, one of those big check things back there. We did 12,000 for the Canadian Cancer Society. We did 25,000 for Island Hospice. We did, so we've done a lot of community work and well, and it's kind of intertwined, like, People know that they're supporting the charities we work for, but they also know that they're going to get a great night of high quality wrestling that is going to be a good show and not just some, you know, skinny, pasty white kids, you know, trying to imitate their favorite WWE stars, right? So it's been kind of like that. And uh, it's been good. The show has been good. The attendance has been good. But again, unfortunately, like we were talking about earlier, soon as we've been going good now for 15 years this year. We've been running Red Rock, and we've sold out pretty near every venue we've had. We've averaged between 450 and as high as 2,200 fans. And, uh, you know, our average is usually around 650, 700. And so we're, we're, we're doing well that way, but we're also bringing the community in and, the wrestlers are visiting kids in hospitals and, you know, stuff like that. So it, the, the support has been reciprocated between both the public to us for the wrestling and, uh, and for the charities we do as well. Amazing. And what's the next step then? Do you, do you, do you try to get a TV deal with it or are you just happy doing these shows for the community end of it? What does Cowboy Mike Hughes want to do on the horizon? Uh, I'd love, we have a TV deal here with Eastlink. But okay. we've had um, a lot of issues. We have to find some new staff now for doing a lot of our digital editing and stuff like that. We lost a few people in that area. So right now we're kind of regrouping and rebuilding. And then we would like to get a new season out on public TV here. But I'd also like to get more out into the Internet. Like as I, we talked earlier, I'm still trying to work my carrier pigeon as far as my technology. <laughs> I still have a pager and a carrier pigeon. So, uh, I, you know, I, I have to, I need a lot of help with that side of it, but I'd like to bring the product to more people, whatever the TV deal is. But right now we have the local access and people, you know, say they see it. It's not on the greatest time or whatever, but people see me all the time and be like, ah, I seen your TV show the other day. It was pretty good. But, we, uh, yeah, we have to kind of delve back into that. I mean, you know, I'd, it's funny. I, I always, I'm like half a step out of wrestling and then I go and put both feet on the other side of the line and I'm back in all the way for a minute. And then the toe crosses the line that I want to be out again. And then, and then I, I get fired up and I want to go, go, go again. And it, it's, you know, it's, it, you know how it is. It's an addiction, man. It's, Dude, Even when our bodies and our brains tell us this isn't good, we still do it. Last night, last night alone, I was, uh, we had a, a ring rental for a company, right? So one of our, one of our rings, uh, we drive it out there and it's a company and I also do commentating for the company, right? Okay. It's, it's uh, the company's called Neo Pro Wrestling out of Niagara Falls. They've been around for a Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, um. Jesse's, you know, Jesse, yeah. uh, yeah. T player, right? Going through. Yeah horrible stuff right now you know what i yeah. mean but, love uh, that guy man he did a tour out here with us and jc playa has got like he's got one of the of all my years in pro wrestling yeah. and all the promos i've ever heard he cut a promo in moncton that will be in my head till the day i die and i will giggle and like a little like i laugh so hard i'll just think of that randomly someday and i'll i'll have like tears in my eyes from laughing at it like yeah. He's such yeah. a good dude, man. It's, that's know. the kind of dude that uh, that JT Playa is. And so they had their show, and I'm doing the commentating. And then I find myself, you know, even before the show, I'm like, who's 
who because I'm doing commentating, you want to get a feel for it. I'm like, who's the agent for this one? Who's doing it? Oh, we don't have one. I'm like, so now I find myself talking to these guys. Well, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? This seems kind of silly. What's the business end of it? Blah, blah, blah. And then afterwards, I find myself after the show, I'm having all these discussions with people about their stuff and even, you know, the promoters. And I'm, I'm I wanted to be on the road an hour and a half ago. And I feel like fucking Robert waiting for Robert Malay trying to fucking get changed at the end of the show, <laughs> waiting for Kurgan, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he's lost he's lost in the grocery store reading magazines about kung fu yeah so but but you know it's it's that feeling it's like you try to you try to get out of it but that toe is still back in it then it's a foot in it and you know but is is it's one of those feelings and then once you have that so much it's so in your life for so many years it's it's the best addiction you could ever possibly have you know, I've heard the saying, the wrestling's like the mafia. Once you're in, you can't get out, right? So it's like, it, it's true, right? You just, and i all like, okay. There was actually over COVID, I was almost, I was like ready to sell everything. And I'm like, okay, I think I'm done. Like, because everybody was in that funk after COVID, right? I was like, well, there's never going to be live crowds again. Half the people are going to be skeptical to go into crowds again. I may as well just sell this and this is my clean break. Because I tore my Achilles over COVID. And, you know, everybody thought the world was collapsing. So I was just like, fuck it, I'm out. I'm done of wrestling. I'm done of everything. I'm just going to, you know, live out in the country and PEI here and ride my motorcycle. And, you know, so it, as far as wrestling goes, it's done. But then as soon as we fired back up again and started getting the itch again, I seen some live events we're doing again. So I threw my our first show up. The place is packed and they're hot. And then I was like, all right, let's. Here we go, you know, and next yeah. thing you know, yeah. I've got 10 shows booked for the year or whatever. And yeah. Well, Back maybe this is, maybe this is a sign. I mean, you've already done it once. You've already put out a TV show, right? Called wrestling with reality, where you talk, you know, it's following the guys around. Maybe this is now an opportunity to do a, a, a second generation. Not so much like you at the head of the helm, driving the, driving the team, but it's centered around your guys that work for red rock wrestling. Who knows? I'm just saying. Well, uh, so speaking of that, there's, there's something in the pipe right now. That's, uh, we can't really talk about it. Uh, a lot of the details, but as far as wrestling reality goes, there's, uh, for some reason after 17 years or 15 years, and all of a sudden, uh, they re-released it on Tubi and a bunch of these other things. Now, all of a sudden, there's a lot of, what are these guys doing now? Right. You know what I mean? And so there's been a lot of interest. And there's been a couple of production companies that are talking. So okay. I think there will be a big announcement coming fairly soon. There's a new Wrestling Reality Facebook page that just got released in the last couple of weeks. So, you know, yeah. there's a... There's, uh, there's some stuff brewing for sure. And yeah, maybe when that, that it's supposed to be around October, I think is when things really start churning. So yeah, it'd be cool to, to talk about that one when I'm allowed to talk about that one a Absolutely. little more. Right? As soon as you have the ability to talk about it, uh, you know me, man, I'd love to have you back on here. And there's so many other stories about so many other guys that you talked about in, in your travels that, you know, we can, we can drum up some, Here's the thing. And I say this to people all the time. I'm not a journalist. I like to have conversations with people that I like and people that I know, but in doing so, I will never, ever ask anybody to be a fucking stooge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still yeah. one of the boys with the boys for the boys and always <laughs> will be that way. So it's entirely up to the people who and what they want to talk about. And that's the beautiful thing. Mike, uh, I want to thank you so much, brother. This has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, you know, it's been far too long since we've, we talked, to way each, too long. we talked to each other online and stuff like that, but it's been way too long since we've actually laid eyes on one another and yeah. let's, let's not, uh, let's not let that time go by again, you know, and the more time that I get to talk to you is the less time that I have to talk to Peter Smith. <laughs> well, that's a good thing, right? That's what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> Tremendous. Uh, Mike, where can anybody get a hold of you if they do want to follow Red Rock, if they want to stalk you, if they want to send you random pictures? What? Uh, how do they get a hold of you, brother? Uh, so it's at Cowboy with a K M H. That's my Instagram. And I'm on their Facebook and then also at Red Rock Wrestling Facebook page also to see what's going on there. Check it out. Like we have. We have great, as you know, Tid, when 
I put together a roster. It's big dudes that can work. When you think back to that real action wrestling tour when we first met, everybody was like 6'4", 250 and bigger, right? Like old school, big smash mouth wrestling. So that's what Red Rock Wrestling is. And uh, yeah, check us out there at the Red Rock Wrestling Facebook page. Uh, definitely. Awesome. Mike Hughes, love you to death. Everybody else, sit right there. We're going to wrap this whole thing up. This has been TID's Kick in the Head on the Law Live Audio Wrestling. We'll be right back. All right. Love it, brother. Thank you very much.